He was barely of boy, lived through adventure enough for a lifetime. Bloody battle, the and surrender, brushes with death and long distance romances. He showed unflinching bravery and tragic inexperience. He was called a hothead, a schemer, a thief, an assassin. At 22, he started a war between the greatest powers on earth. At 26, his life seemed over. This trial by fire would forge the greatest man America has ever seen. These are the unknown years of young George Washington. After five years of uneasy truce, England and France are about to go back to war. This time to decide the fate of a continent. By 1753, English colonies along the Atlantic coast are hemmed in by the French in Quebec and Louisiana. Westward stretches untold wealth by grow richer. Whoever controls the Ohio Valley holds the key to the American heartland. Already, a group of Virginia gentlemen have formed a company to claim the Ohio country for England. Among them, an ambitious, self-styled aristocrat, Robert Dinwiddie, Virginia. At his side, a welted plantation owner named Washington. While the Virginians scheme, the French act. French troops to the th Pennsylvania forest and erect a series of forts leading to the Ohio. Dinwiddie is furious. He turns for help to a higher power, the King of England. The monarch responds with an edict that cracks like thunder across the Ohio wilderness. If you shall find that any person shall presume to erect a fort within the limits of our province of Virginia, you are to require them to depart. If they still endeavor to carry on such unlawful designs, we hereby strictly charge you to drive them off with first arms. King George II. Governor Dinwiddie sets about recruiting a volunteer, any man motion, risking his life. Wilson is managing the Ohio Company. He's also entertaining his adolescent half-brother at his Potomac River plantation. The teenager is George Washington. What we have is a boy loses his father. George Washington is coming in lessons and he loses his father. This is the guiding figure who would teach him how to be a man, who would teach him what is expected of him in, like, in Virginia society. And he loses a man. And as a result of that, he ended up looking to his elder half-brother Lawrence, who was 14 years older than he was. He looked to Lawrence for guidance, and Lawrence was really a role model for Washington. Lawrence sailed the Kish warship under Edward Vernon. He was so taken by his service, he named his estate in honor of the Admiral. When conversation at Mount Vernon turned to military matters, was ears in for an adventure at sea just Lawrence had, but his mother forbid it. By teen, George's schooling is over. He will read and study on his own for the rest of his life of learning. He will never earn a formal education. Years later, John Adams would have is no scholar. He's too unlearned for his station and reputation. What young George does manage to teach himself is the art of being a gentleman. I get the, the feeling that we're seeing a young man who may at times just be simply sitting a little bit back from the main movers of this society and just seeing it all in. He's just seeking it up. And he does indeed um, hold on to much of what he learns in these early years throughout the rest of his life. He copies out 110 maxims called rules of civility and decent behavior in company and conversation. 
A lot of these rules um, seem to be very small things. Uh, don't spit in the fire. Don't pick your teeth with a fork at the table. Don't put your boots under the fire, especially if there's a joint. I like, I like that rule particularly. The whole thrust of the rules is to make you aware of your uh, company, your company of peers. George's greatest problem is self-control. He has a quick temper and other aquinotis. He was an angry young man. Life was an issue. It was something that he tried to control. He never completely control, but it was something he was always working. At 15, George discovers the surveyor tools his father and his laid out for him. By the summer of his 17th year, he's earning the new town of Alexandria on the Potomac. By 18, he has nearly 2,000 acres of his own. Throughout his 19th year, the young surveyor remains absorbed in his other pursuit, apprenticing under Lawrence as a Virginia gentleman. It's a wonderful apprenticeship for him. I mean, it's the perfect age. Luckily, Lawrence is willing to step in and to take this role to teach his younger stepbrother what is indeed expected of him. In July, 1752, young Washington's apprenticeship abruptly ends. His stepbrother and mentor, Lawrence, dies of tuberculosis. For George, it's a stunning loss. Yet adversity is followed by opportunity, a pattern that recurs throughout Washington's life. Six months later, in to follow in Lawrence's footsteps, George is in Williamsburg, campaign post other once held as commander of the Virginia militia. Uh, tall, taller than average, oh, well over six feet. He's impressive looking, he's athletic, he's already a horseman. Uh, he is a surveyor. He's been uh, learning civility and manners. He's been taking dancing lessons. And he's trying to suit himself to be a gentleman and a leader in his society. Governor Dinwiddie grants a commission to the ambitious young man who has never earned a uniform. Just short of his 21st birthday, the gang boy has become George Washington. In October, when news arrives that Governor Dinwiddie, someone French, Williamsburg, and the volunteers, despite that, the governor sizes him up. It's rather remarkable, I think, that the governor and the council looked as mean young men. Maybe they thought he was a fool. <laughs> Here is the mess and deliver it. I mean, he's fearless. In Dinwiddie's ultimatum to the friend, the world sees first time. George Washington. The damp hill of a late autumn morning, the nervous volunteer sets up on the adventure of his life. He could have had a comfortable life as a country. He wants more. A part of it is glory, looking for the adventure. And he's looking for the honors that come from having a great adventure. One can make the argument that Washington was in American history. Everything that he was, everything that he would become, came about militarily in five years, 1783, 1758. All of his military experiences, for which he was, are solely based in five years. This day I arrived at Fredericksburg, engaged Mr. Jacob, and brought him to Alexandria. We brought a new road to Wills Creek. Here, I engaged Christopher Gist to pilot us. Also hired four other editors. Chris Gist is a fur trade mid. Back in the drawings of Williamsburg, these men would have had in common. Here, the Ohio wilderness, two entrance, spot, and land. Christopher is a developer. He was looking for places to stake out. It was a group of people, Washington and his group, for perhaps the first time in history, were looking at land in a completely different way. Up until that time, in Virginia and elsewhere, land had been looked at according to what it could produce. Now, these guys were looking at land with a sort of piece in their eye, saying, how many times can we sell this? And none of any idea of farming was first speculators.
George Washington is to deliver an ultimatum to the French commander to abandon the old. But first, he must find it. The French and British interests have better to cross the ed around each other in, in the wilderness in North America with their with their claws out, not not quite was not quite aware where the other crab was. Lee Brahm search up. Washington gets hurry head to where Mahala joins the Alec of the Ohio. Strategic dominates the entire region. I spent time viewing the rivers and thinking situated for a fort, as it has the absolute command of the rivers, has wedded, and is very convenient for... You have got a young man who is practicing the military. He is already to study. It's essential that he this land for its military potential. He may have, uh, have not gotten read a book at some point, but uh, vacations as a, a military engineer was just but inescapable that this was and would be a critical point. If you're where. In, in that quadrant of the country, you're going to pass the forks of the Ohio. The forks, Walkstown, and Iroquois, Ohio. Here he recruits and meets the Seneca chief, Tana Cherison, known by the British as Half King. He was a sophisticated and intelligent ambassador who was doing what the Iroquois always did check Buddy out, making sure that they were on the side of whoever the winner turned out to be. Most tribes are allied to the French who trap fur rather than the British who are stout. The Shawnee had a said, beware of a white man at the sky. He's to figure out how to do you. The entire party pushes north until it reaches a small out the forest. For time, Washington sees an enemy flag, a plain white cloth flapping in the winter breeze like a bedsheet. Here's this young kid with no military experience, no education, no frontier experience, who confronts these seamed French colonial authors. <laughs> no, here comes this awkward wood. Washington strides and comes face to face with Captain Philip Thomas Shankar. He invited us to sup with them and treated us with the greatest complaint. The wine, as they dosed themselves, soon banished their restraint and gave license to those to reveal their sentiments more freely. Drinks very little and quietly studies his hosts. Suddenly, Jean Care erupts. It is our possession of the Ohio, and by God we will do it. To cap the evening, Washington's Erie group is told Fort Le Beau Hill some 60 miles farther north sets out again into what he calls four days of excessive rains, snows, and bad traveling. When he reaches the fort, Washington changes into his finest dress uniform to meet the commandant, Le Gardeur de Saint-Pierre. Of the wilderness, the atmosphere is as formal as the court of Versailles. While Saint-Pierre infers with his officers, Washington roams freely, quietly gathering intelligence. That night, Saint-Pierre replies to Dinwiddie's ultimatum. Sir, as I have the honor of commanding here, Mr. Washington delivered me the letter which you wrote. I do not think myself obliged to obey it. Come morning, Washington prepares to leave. His Indians do not. They've been captured by French hospitality. The first fight of Washington's career is a battle of wills. Washington just had had enough of it, and he just threw aside all pretense to politeness, and he, he went eyeball to eyeball with Anna and he said, get in the boat. <laughs> now. And, and that, to my way of thinking, is the first sight of true steel in this man. I went to Half King and pressed him in the strongest terms to go. I can't say that I suffered so much anxiety as I did in this affair. For seven days, they break icy streams, deep snow, in temperatures near zero.
anchor to reach Williamsburg Port. Washington once more is Bromage and races ahead with Christopher Gist. They meet alone, and Washington asks him to guide them. Gist notes, we traveled very brisk eight or ten miles when the Major's feet grew very sore and he was very weary. Well, they come to a particular clearing, and the Indian moves ahead and then wheels, aims, and fires. Gist wants to kill the Indian on the spot, but Washington lets him go. If you are an Indian, you're confronting two armed Virginians. Why would you stand in the meadow and take a pot shot at one of them? I mean, what's your strategic thinking? What's your plan? <laughs> well, it's never clear. Bone tired and bitterly cold, they push hard through drifting snow and finally reach the Allegheny. They expect to find it frozen solid and to simply walk across. There was no way for getting over but on a raft, which was about with but one poor hatchet. We expected every moment our raft to sink and ourselves to perish. I put out my setting pole to try to stop the raft when the rapidity of the stream threw it with such violence against the pole that it went out into 10 feet of water. The exhausted men spend a freezing night on an island in midstream. The next morning, they set out again for the comforts of Virginia, still some 300 miles off. Their trip, says Washington, is as fatiguing a journey as it is possible to conceive. In January 1754, Washington reports to Governor Dinwiddie. He is so pleased with the way uh, Washington handled the mission that he responsibility on this young man. And what he wants Washington to do is to take command of a force of Virginia troops and to march them up to the forks of the Ohio, where a fort is already being built. Uh, and Washington's assignment is to oversee the completion of the fort and then hold it against the French. The major is now a colonel and one step closer to his true goal, an officer's commission in the British Army. He saw as many people do, great opportunity in impending war. There's money to be made and there's fame to be obtained and there's all kinds of opportunity in war. And, and, and we see this in Washington. He, he burrowed his way to the center of events as this war seemed to be approaching. Setting off on April 2nd, Washington once runs into trouble the same problems that will hound him two decades later. Ill-trained poor soldiers and officers carping about low pay. Even worse, wagons and teams that were promised are nowhere in Reaching Winchester after a week's journey, Washington grows desperate to find his men horses, and he raids Abel's of the farmers. There were two warrants sworn for the arrest of George Washington. Pass and thievery for coming onto people's land and their horse wagons. One of them is endorsed by the sheriff, not served out of the gentleman me off by force of arms. Nobody ever painted that scene <laughs> of Washington <laughs> drawing a bead on the sheriff. To... Washington's greatest obstacle is the forest itself. This is painfully slow sometimes just two miles away. Three weeks, the men hack their way over great savage mountain and grope their way through a dark glade as black as its name, Shades of Death. Washington strikes off on his own to explore a water route to the foot of the Ohio. 
but the shortcut is blocked by a fifth waterfall. Two months and more than 200 miles later, Washington awaits the French at a clearing called Great Meadows. On May 27, 1754, he writes Governor Dinwiddie. We have, with nature's assistance, prepared a charming field for an encounter. He seems to be very impressed with him at this and uh, as, as young men going in their first encounter with warfare tend to be. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's an intoxication about being commanded and, and guns, and, uh, and he's on the pod, very much ready to get down to it. That night, an Indian scout brings fateful news. A French patrol is nearby, determined, he says, to strike the first AC. Washington's ally, F. King, urges him to attack first. Just after dawn, the Virginians and their Indians catch the French off guard. Suddenly, a spots them, and Washington gives the order to fire. essentially begun a war between these two major empires. I mean, he started it. This one young Virginian in the backwoods of the American colonies begins a war. In 15 minutes, the fight is over, and Frenchmen are dead. One the edition's 36-year-old commander, Lieutenant Joseph Coulon de Germanville. In this very small engagement, in fact, even be called a battle, was more of a skirmish. Washington, warning, a complete surprise, killed 10 out of the 35-man French party. Was he a hero? Was he a criminal? The French were shocked because the French would claim at that time and later that this was not a party that was out skulking to attack Washington. This was a diplomatic, this was an ambassador who basically had the same orders to give to Washington that Washington had given to the French, which was, you must depart from this country. If you do not do it, you'll be forced out. Washington sends a report and 20 prisoners off of Witty. These officers pretend they were coming on an embassy, but the absurdity of this pretext is too glaring. They were sent as spies, I doubt not that they will endeavor to amuse your honor with many smooth stories. It was this gunfire that the French philosopher Voltaire referred to and said, a shot fired in the wilderness set the world ablaze. The war that changed Europe and North America began with Washington's questionable actions at Germonville on May 28, 1754. The following day, Washington writes his younger brother. I heard the bullets whistle, and there is something charming in the sand. I love the notion of King George being up for this remark. You know, I envision him as being this Germanic uh, person with very little sense of humor. I mean, there's no evidence that King George had a sense of humor, but he did uh, sort of heave a chuckle over this, <laughs> being told that Washington thought the sound of bullets was charming. And he said, did he really? Well, he says, I expect he has not heard very many of them. His letter is intercepted by the French and published throughout Europe. The British journalist Horace Walpole writes, the volley fired by a young Virginian in the backwoods of America set the world on fire. Flushed with his little victory against the French, George Washington marches back to Great Meadows. The French won't be far behind. In two days, he erects a small, rickety stockade, 53 feet in diameter. Fort Necessity at Great Meadows 
uh, was built very rapidly. And this shows Washington's inexperience uh, because it really wasn't built in any sort of manner that could withstand a uh, significant French attack. His ally, Half King, dubs it that little thing in the meadow. But to Wine's untrained eye, it appears so sturdy, he writes, I shall not fear the attack of 500 men. On the morning of July 3rd, 1754, 600 French and Indians attack. The French were commanded by the half-brother of Jumonville, who, of course, was burning revenge because he felt Washington had murdered his brother. Washington's men now pay the price for his inexperience. 70 Virginians are wounded. 30 are killed. We were determined not to ask for mercy, one wrote. We could not hope for victory. Unknown to Washington, the French think reinforcements are on the way, 5,000 strong. The young colonel is prepared to die on the spot when he hears a shout from the woods. Voulez-vous parler? Voulez-vous parler? A French soldier asks, do you want to talk? Watt sends interpreter Jacob von Brahm for the terms of surrender. That night, von Brahm returns with a document soaked by a sudden downpour and smeared. It's nearly impossible to translate. But Washington, after three hours of thought, signed the document indicating he would surrender Fort Necessity, surrender the little garrison, and admit to being the assassin of the French emissary, Jumonville. After the fact, however, Washington claimed that he had no idea that he was calling himself or admitting that he was an assassin. Uh, and he tried to find a fall guy, and he found his fall guy in Jacob von Brahm, who he said had not accurately uh, translated the surrender papers, and so he didn't realize that he was admitting that he was a murderer. George Washington awakes to the sound of defeat, the place he called a charming field for an encounter is the scene of devastation. The date of his surrender would always be an unhappy anniversary. July the 4th. And you've got to believe that there was never a July 4th in George Washington's life that he didn't think about subjects very different than we now think about on July 4th. Sullen and spent, the young colonel departs for Williamsburg. Often, Mr. Washington, he says, was very sad company. Washington has become a liability to Governor Dinwiddie. The once promising colonel is faced with demotion to Kingston. A king's commission now seems impossible. Age 22, George Washington hangs up his sword, retires. This was the first retirement from public life forever. Uh, this was his first... Uh, uh, I'm, you don't have George Washington to kick around anymore. His path to glory is not going to be straight and, uh, and without bumps. And this was a jolt, a speed bump he had gone over. And so he, um, he goes and retires for the time being. In December 1754, Colonel Washington becomes Squire Washington of Mount Vernon. But the war he touched off is blazing. In February 1755, two British regiments land in Virginia, led by 60-year-old Major General Edward Braddock. Within days, Braddock is congratulated on his... I wish for nothing more earnestly, George Warren writes, than to attain a small degree of knowledge in the military art. Meeting Braddock and Alexander, 
he offers to serve without rank or pay. Braddock wanted Washington because he knew how experienced he was. Young though he was, he had been out of Ohio two times before. He knew the area, he knew the enemy, he knew the so he could be valuable to Braddock. When he decided what he wanted to do, he just wore everybody down. I mean, this was a, a strange kind of an appointment, a civilian aide to a, to a British general on a major campaign. But there he was. In the summer of 1755, the large army yet seen in America hacks its way toward the forks of the Ohio, now guarded by the French at Fort Duquesne. Washington himself, he has dysentery so bad he can barely mount a horse. Yet glory lies along with a British commission. On July 8th, still burning with fever, Washington kept with the army. The next day, Exfors is just one day's march from victory. He kept his army protected for all these days, building the road. He had made sure that there was no chance of an attack on his force. He had skirmishers and scouts out. He, any elevation hills nearby, he made sure that they were, before he even got near them, he was careful. Inexplicably, Braddock pulls in his scouts and lowers his guard. PM's vanguard runs head on into the enemy. The British fire first. Their volley kills the French commander. This moment, the battle for lost. Now comes one of the great question marks in American history. What happened to Braddock's command? The vanguard of General Braddock can advance forward and probably push the enemy away and move on to Fort Duquesne. Instead, the vanguard retreats. The Britishers panic and run, says Washington, like sheep before the hounds. A soldier writes, men drop like leaves in autumn. Washington has two horses shot from underneath him. Six foot three on his horse, fire. Washington is shown very early in his life. He can lead men, groups. In the midst of this confusion, he keeps his head. He can keep calm enough to get some kind of order. It means that there's something inherent in the character or in his training that allows him simply to step in a situation like this and take over. In three hours, the battle is over. All of Braddock's aides are wounded or dead, except Washington. Braddock himself is dying. Chaos of battle is replaced, says Washington, with groans, lamentation cries along the road of the wounded. This vid scene will live on in his nightmares. Washington Braddock's body beneath the very deep blades. If the enemy knew where he buried soldier rights, they would dig him up and scalp him. Washington is now seen on his third trip to the Ohio. With these little skirmishes in Longville, not the Syrup Fort Necessity, he is now seen an unmitigated disaster. And this time, the disaster is with a British general and two full regiments of British troops. With the expedition in ruins, Washington returns to Mount Vernon, where he dispels of his death. I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectations, for I had four bullets, Mike. Two horses shot under me, yet ate unhurt. Although death was leveling my companions every side of me. Well, I think Braddock's defeat was very sobering to him. Uh, a year earlier, he'd been riding with bullets, and I've been charmed by the sound. Well, he was so charmed when the bullets were flying through his coat and killing us, most of his fellow officers. Nothing is to be seen or heard of but desolation and murder. The smoke of plantations darkens the day and hides the neighboring mountains from our sight. Adam Steffen, 
1776. After victory over Braddock, French ushered their Indian allies along the frontier. Commanding the Virginia at Winchester, Washington is close enough to smell the smoke of burning farms, but helpless to stop it. Here's a man who was supposed to defend 400 miles of wilderness with a good people. You couldn't do it today with helicopters and, and, uh, <laughs> and infrared cameras. You could not secure that 400 mile today. And here he sits with this responsibility for the defense of the Western frontier. Washington faces an enemy in his own name, desertion. Ignatius Edwards and William Smith were hanged Thursday last. Your honor will, I hope, excuse my hanging instead of shooting them. It can much more terror the others, and it was for example's sake we did it. How do you get people to fight that don't want to fight? How do you maintain discipline among people who are not used to any kind of discipline at all and who could walk away from you any minute? How do you fight without enough ammunition, without enough food, without enough shelter? How do you march further than anybody marched before? These are the things that he learned, but he didn't think those were the lessons that mattered. Despite the frustrations of command, Washington still craves a king commission. In February, 1750, 100 miles to Boston to plead his case with the British commander-in-chief. He's turned down. The next year, he visits a new commander in Philadelphia with no better So the 1755 to 58 period, Washington is one of great frustration, poor health, and a time when he hoped commission, and every year it looked less and less likely he will ever become an officer. It's one of the great ifs in American history. What if the British had granted one mission? Uh, it's entirely likely that when the American Revolution commenced, Washington had been fighting for the British, and he would have been one of the high-ranking officers. In 1757, Washington's military career is interrupted when again he struck down with dysentery. Wrecked by high fevers and violent pains, he becomes gravely ill. On November 8th, George Washington is sent home to die. The moment he arrives at Mount Vernon, Washington writes Sally Fairfax, the wife of his neighbor, telling her of his illness. This was a... Uh black-haired beauty with big dogs, very uh, flirtatious and vicious. And I think George Washington did fall in love with Fairfax. I believe that he had a crush on her. Construe not my meaning. Doubt it's it. The world has no business to know the object. As soon as he hears that news, off uh, immediately to visit a plantation on the Pamunkey River, uh, knows the White House, where the young widow Martha Custis is living. Martha Dandridge Cut and a widow for only eight months when George meets her at a dinner party. She's short, slightly plump, and pleasant with your old boy and a two-year-old girl. She describes herself as an old-fashioned housekeeper, steady as a clock, busy as a bee, and cheerful as a cricket. The very next day, George visits Martha in her home. After a three courtship, they're engaged. Martha Custis would make a wonderful wife. She is a very wealthy widow with good family connections. Granted, there's no great love here, but there certainly can be admiration, there can be like, there can be respect between the two of them. So he courts Martha Custis. Things are looking up for George Washington. He has a fiance, his health, and a his commission. As the year 1788 opens, yet another British commander arrives in North America. He still was looking for opportunities to serve the British forces. This is a man still on the make, and he sees another possibility when General Forbes enters through. 
Brigadier General John Forbes takes command of a new expedition to see Fort Duquesne. He soon receives a hearing letter from a young Virginian. I have no higher ambition than to act my part well during the campaign. It gives me no small pleasure that an officer of your experience, abilities, and character would be appointed to command the expedition. In Philadelphia, Forbes takes Washington into his service, but does not take his advice. Abandoning out-of-the-way Braddock's Road, Forbes straight across Pennsylvania. Washington is devastated. Braddock's Road runs right through Washington's property in Virginia. With one eye on his investment, he protests Forbes' decision while claiming, I cannot be supposed to have any private interests. This war is going to be over, and when it's over, settlers are going to move west. And I think Washington was smart enough, as many others are smart enough, to see that the military road was going to be the road west. And getting that military road through his own property was the main chance of the campaign. This may be the low point in Washington's military career, which is already full of lopes. By November 1758, what Washington fears most has happened. Pennsylvania places Virginia as the base of British operations. Washington is ordered to Loyal Hanna, three miles east of Fort Duquesne. Late in the afternoon of November, scouts and Washington heads out to intercept. Not far becomes a second squad of Virginia. Washington's men mistake them for the enemy. When they fail to hear his order to cease fire, Washington dashes into the melee. Ah! This is the act not only a certain impetuosity, which I guess is part of rape. Bravery is not calculating the odds and then going in if they look right. Bravery is just you see what has to be you go and do. Washington is nearly killed. Years later, he will say, I was never in more danger in my life. By November 24th, there are only a dozen miles from Fort Duquesne. General Forbes camps near the site of Braddock's defeat, faces for battle. All night, the only sound of the lapping of the Monongahela and the murmur of sleepless men. Just after, a shout breaks the tension. The French have gone. Forbes takes Fort Duquesne without bringing a shot. But for George Washington, this British is a defeat. It was a winning campaign in which he had come in a role, and this one, and Washington was more bitter about the Forbes campaign than about any previous campaign he'd been involved with. Washington called Fort Duquesne seen his military career in ruins. Washington retires, as he knew for the last time. He was denied the glory he dreamed of, denied elected, and did the road to make his fortune. At 26, Washington heads home to life of obscurity. When you see all of his ailings, I think he becomes a greater human being because you see the did not repeat the mistakes as as commander-in-chief of the American forces during the Revolution. He learned in this school of war how to be a man and how to be a leader. And he takes that back with into private life in Virginia, and it will still be with him when he has to go to war again. Washington would write, if an old proverb will apply to my case, I shall close with success, for no man could have had a worse beginning. These early years of fame were just a rehearsal for greatness. The trials of his youth would bear George Washington for the most remarkable role in the history of America. <laughs>